We're so glad you're here. Would you stand with us and let's sing together this great, great song of our faith.
have a seat. Our funny guy is gone today, <clears throat> so I'm not even going to try to do that. But I do have something very important to share with you. Paul said this, if anyone is in Christ, the new cre creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. And all this is from God who, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, which makes us all breathe a big sigh of relief, does it not? And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal to everybody else through us. And then he says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. This morning, we have a chance, an opportunity to be Christ's ambassadors, just right where you are, right where you sit. You can take out that smart device, and you can go to our church's page, and you can share the live stream of what's going on right now in your life, in your worship world, as we've gathered here as a church family. And you can share that with everybody who is your best friend or your worst enemy, whichever way it is on your particular page. Those who follow you will know that you stand for Jesus simply because you've taken the moment to hit share. Do that, would you? Or not? <laughs> uh, the other thing is you can also share on our page tomorrow night at 5 o'clock. We're having candlelight and carols and communion here as we celebrate Christmas Eve service and uh, love for you to share that with those that you influence. There are lots and lots of statistics that talk about the truth that if people are invited, they're a lot more apt to come, particularly if they're invited by somebody who knows them. And so if you really don't like all the family that you're going to be gathered around the table with tomorrow night and say, hey, let's go to church. It'll be great. No. I told you I shouldn't try to be funny. Anyway, our, our point is that God has blessed us. He has reconciled us to himself through Jesus. And that great love is our gift to share with everybody with whom we come in contact. That's who we are as a church. That's what we're about. And we trust that you are on mission with us to do that. If this is your first time, please take a moment. Go to the app store, download our app, and there you can... Um, let us know. You'll hit the I'm new button and you can let us know how we can contact you so that we can help you get on mission with us. Because again, that's what we're all about here at First Baptist. Trust that you are experiencing uh, the joy of Christmas. Hopefully all the shopping is done and all that mess is behind you and you can lock in for the, at, at least, if no other, for the next few minutes on what this season is all about. So would you stand and do something really novel? Say Merry Christmas to the folks that you're worshiping near.
So this morning, we get to continue with our celebration of Advent as we light this fourth candle. You've probably already figured out from the video, the candle of love. This love that we've experienced in Jesus, the one who has reconciled us with our great, big, wonderful, amazing, loving God. Let's continue to worship as we sing.
shall have eternal life. I shall hold to the cross, and I shall That's good seeing you. I guess y'all are the ones who didn't travel this Christmas, right? So it'll be your turn next year, but I'm glad that you're here, and uh, we certainly want to be uh, praying for all those in our church family that are not here this morning that are, uh, that are traveling to be with uh, family. That's just a part of this uh, season. Again, let me remind you about uh, tomorrow, 5 o'clock. 
our uh, big Christmas Eve uh, candlelight service, and you'll want to be here early. Uh, you may not get your normal seat, so uh, don't let that uh, knock you off a little bit. Uh, but just uh, go ahead and get here. Five o'clock, we'll kick off the, um, the candlelight service together. Let's open our Bibles this morning to uh, the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1. I know that's probably uh, an unusual place, starting place for a, a message, that uh, an Advent message having to do with the theme of, of love. And uh, that's intentional. I think that's a, a good thing because too often uh, we get locked in on, on understanding things and thinking about things uh, just one way uh, because we lack a vision to see other possibilities. Uh, Walter Isaacson is a gifted biographer. He's written a series of biographies. One group of them he calls the genius biography. Stephen Jobs uh, is one of those. Uh, Einstein, Leonardo da Vinci, Ben Franklin. Uh, wonderfully rich biographies. He, he writes in a wonderful, even though they're, they're biographical, historical, uh, he writes in a very uh, spellbinding narrative form. Uh, so, so they're very good reads. But but he talks about these, these genius personalities and uh, that they are visionaries. They have an insatiable appetite, curiosity, which he really sees, Isaacson sees and understands as being the root of, of genius, is that they are, are curious. They've never lost their, their curiosity. Now, of course, that kind of, uh, those kind of, of personalities, extreme geniuses like the ones that I've mentioned, there, there's also a negative side to that. Whenever you have that kind of, of vision, that kind of intellect, you're usually lacking in other uh, areas of your life, and uh, many times it's in social functions. Steve Jobs, for instance, was uh, really very, uh, even though it's extremely high IQ, his EQ was very low and uh, really oftentimes came across as immature, like a petulant child sometimes, especially like when he was creating things like the iPhone. He was able to tell his research and development, uh, just give them, gave them kind of an overall portrait of what he was thinking of, but, but he, he really wasn't specific enough. And whenever they would bring him a prototype, his engineers in R&D, something that they had uh, created that they thought might satisfy him, he would look at it and sometimes he would just take it and throw it against the wall in anger, or he would throw it in his fish tank in anger. No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. And they would say, can you be more specific in telling us what you're seeing, what you're envisioning? He said, no, I, I can't. He said, but I'll know it when I see it. It's not a lot to go on, is it? Leonardo da Vinci was a man of extreme vision, knew what he wanted. What most people don't realize about Leonardo da Vinci is he has more unfinished works than he did finished works. He would come to a place in one of his artistic endeavors, and he would realize that, that he didn't yet have the skill set to perform what he was envisioning. Many of his paintings, he would just walk away. And maybe not return until 15 years later, 8, 10, 15 years later, because at that moment he would come to a point and he had a vision of how something was supposed to look. And he would say to himself, I do not yet have the skill set necessary to fulfill the vision. Visionaries. It's one of the hallmarks of, of true intellect. There's always a curiosity and a vision to experience more. Well, this morning in Revelation... What John is really writing and speaking of, under the inspiration, yes, of the Holy Spirit, it's a vision. It's a vision of, of what God has done and what God is, is doing. He's been given this, this vision of the new heaven and the new earth and how that is going to look. And, and it's apocalyptic language, it's language, and it's a situation where John finds himself really lacking the vocabulary to, to, to adequately capture the vividness of what he is seeing. And what God has revealed to him. But what you discover in this passage, and that's the reason I have us looking at Revelation chapter 1, is, is what you see and what, John, and what John is describing for us at the very heart, listen, at the very heart of all that God has done and all that God is doing, at the very heart of that is love. I want you to listen to these verses that I want us to focus on this morning, looking at verses 4 through 6. 
John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. At the very heart of everything God has done, the Alpha and Omega, from the beginning to the end, at the very heart of it is love. Now, I want us to notice some things about this love because John really gives us some insight to better understanding and appreciating uh, this love of God that we so often just take for granted, that God loves us, yes, but what are the, what are the real, what's the real meaning of that? What are the implications of that? How does that apply to our life? Well, if you notice, if we just go back to verse 5, one of the things that emerges in, just the, in, in the grammar of the verse is that this is an, an initiating love. This is a love that's been initiated by God. Now, this is significant. The love of God that you and I experience, that we understand, yes, from a theological perspective, from an experiential perspective, this is something that has been initiated by God himself. That's what John is saying here when he simply says, to him who loves God us. Now, what, what are the implications of that? When we say that God initiate, initiated his love towards us, there, there's implications to that. For one thing, it, it means for us that, that it is an unconditional love. Now, by, by saying unconditional, I mean that it is it, this love that God has bestowed upon us, it's not, it's not performance-based. It's an unconditional love. It's not performance-based. We are in a world, in a culture, that says, I will love you if, or I will love you when. It's conditional. I'll love you if you do this. I love you when you do this, not God. This is something vastly different. This is something that is not based upon performance. In fact, the Apostle Paul would write, In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, what would Paul say? While we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not performance-based. In fact, I think the order here in those verses that I read earlier is very significant. It says, to him who loves us and released us and has made us a kingdom. So the order there is very important. He takes the initiative in loving us, not after, he has, not after he has liberated us from our sin, not after he has released us from our sin, not after I've made you a, a special kind of kingdom people. Now then you're worthy of my love. This is significant. He initiates his love for us, not on the basis of performance, not anything I've done or anything I've failed to do. But there's another implication here of this initiated love by God that's revealed in in just this one simple word, love. It it also implies that this is a forgiving love. That this love that's been initiated by God, it is a forgiving love as well. The word agape is a word you're all familiar with. If you grew up in church, you're familiar with the word agape. It's an unconditional love, unmerited favor. Uh, My working definition of agape love is agape love is a willed commitment to love in the absence of feelings. Now remember that. It's a willed commitment to love in the absence of feelings. There are three other words that John could have utilized in the Greek language to talk about God's love that he could have used here in this verse, but it, it would not capture the nature and the meaning of agape love. Because every other word in the Greek language, that those three other words in the Greek language that can also be translated in love in English, there's always an emotional factor connected to it, but not agape love. Agape love is used throughout the New Testament to talk about God's love for us, the kind of love that, that we're supposed to have for, for our Heavenly Father. It's the kind of love that is to characterize our kinship for one another as followers of Christ. 
It's the kind of love that is used in Scripture to talk about the love between a husband and a wife. It's a willed commitment to love in the absence of feelings. It means that my commitment to the Father, my commitment to the resurrected Christ, my commitment to my children, my commitment to you as a pastor, my commitment to my wife, it's not based upon feelings. It's a willed commitment to love. Even even in those times when, when feelings are absent. Now, we think, that's a, we think that's some kind of detached love. It, it's not at all. It really embodies the nature of commitment. I mean, after, after 33 years of marriage, 35, <laughs> in the ballpark, 33 to 35 years of marriage, you know, I don't wake up every morning going, oh, baby, do I feel in love this morning? You say, oh, my goodness, does, are Bobby and Patty in trouble? Well, no, not at all. My, as a 60-year-old man and 33 to 35 years of marriage, uh, my, my whole understanding of love and commitment is much richer and fuller and whole and complete than it ever was as a 25-year-old man getting married. I had a whole different set of drives in, uh, in understanding of love at 25 than I do at 60. It's much richer and fuller at 60 than it's ever been in life. And that kind of love, that kind of agape love, has a lot of freedom. It's, it's a lot of forgiveness in that. A lot of, a lot of forgiveness, a lot of, of liberation that comes with that. King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. It's a, a wonderfully rich piece of literature. And you know the story of King Arthur. And in, in part of that story of King Arthur, you know, Guinevere, Guinevere, Lady Guinevere is unfaithful with, with Arthur's best friend, Sir Lancelot. Everybody knows that story. And when, when Arthur returns from a trip, when the king returns and finds out about this, this affair, he, he banishes Guinevere to a convent for the rest of her life. Near the end of her life, King Arthur finds out that she is sick unto death. And he rushes to the convent and confesses his undying love for her, that she was the true love of his life. And it's a very powerful moment in the narrative when he says, Arthur says, I love thee as eternal God loves thee. And he forgives her. Now, that, that's, a, that's a very rich literary moment. I love thee as eternal God loves thee. But it's not good theology. Because our Heavenly Father is not, is not the kind of God that, that consigns sinners to a convent of despair. The agape love that God has for us, the initiative that God is taking towards us is a, is, a, is a love that is always forgiving. It's a love that always picks you up, that always lifts you up. It's a love and a forgiveness that always sees the possibilities in you. And it's also an, an eternal love. This initiative that God is taking, it's also an eternal kind of love. The King James, unfortunately, translates love in the past tense. He loved us. In the Greek, more accurately, it's present tense. He loves us. Now, present tense in English is just, is this moment right now. All right, now then, what I pointed to is now past tense. In the, in the Greek, it's not like that. Present tense is something that is continual and ongoing. So this eternal love that God has bestowed upon us, it is something that continues on. It's not based upon my, our performance. What, it's a kind of love that embraces us today despite what we did yesterday. God takes the initiative. But we also see in this, in this passage, if we notice again that second clause in verse 5, it's a love that's, that's not just initiated, not just an initiating kind of love, but it's also a liberating love. It's a love that's very freeing. It's a love that sets us loose. Now, notice, he uses the term, he released us. To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Released, loosed, liberated. 
Same word is used throughout the New Testament in a variety of ways. Just going through different uh, portions of Scripture. Matthew 21, 2, for instance. When uh, Jesus was telling his disciples to go and prepare a Passover meal, they went and found a colt, part of the triumphal entry, and they loosed the colt. Same word is used here in Revelation chapter 1 by John. You can also find in, in Luke's gospel, chapter 13, the story of a woman that had for 18 years an infirmity. And it said that Jesus laid his hand upon her and she was loosed. She was liberated. She was set free from, from her infirmity. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 24, Luke uses the same word to talk about Jesus being released, loose, freed from, from, his, from his pain. In Acts chapter 22, Luke would use the same word again in verse 30 in talking about the Apostle Paul and his Roman imprisonment that a Roman official came and loosed Paul from his chains, from his chains. And now what we have is that same word being utilized by John in this vision, that the, that the love of God is something that sets you loose. The love of God is something that liberates you. Listen, if your faith and your relationship with Jesus Christ in your mind, if your outlook, remember I talked about vision, the ability to see things bigger, see things a different way instead of this one little myopic outlook. Listen, if your understanding of the life of faith is something that is burdensome and beats you down, you haven't got it. You haven't understood properly. You need to open your eyes and see things different. You have been, in Christ Jesus, you have been set free. You have been loosed. And it's a freedom, this salvation that is given us. It sets us free upon the pathway of discovery of all things that God would have in store for us to become and to experience. But as long as you have this this burden, oh, I can't mess up this and that i got to keep this rule, this rule. Listen, whenever you are set free, whenever you have this understanding of God's love for you and the love that you have for him and the pursuit that you're living for in chasing after him, listen, all the rules and regulations will take care of itself, but it cannot become the the basis of the life you live. It cannot become foundational to your understanding of salvation. We are set free. We are set loose. And it's only as you get that, this is probably the most important part of this message today, until you really get that sense of being set free and set loose, you never experience faith as God desires for you to experience faith. There's a story, it's called The the Burglar's, the Burglar's Christmas. It's written by Willa Cather. But in this story, The Burglar's Christmas, it's about about a man named William. William's at a lonely place in his life. He has no job. He's really at a place of despair in his life, living in Chicago. And it's on a a Christmas night that it dawns upon William that he does not have the qualities necessary to be successful in life. Now, he's gone through his adult life, and he's he's given the illusion of success. He says that he has been agile enough to fool people into thinking that that he is successful. But he realizes on that Christmas night that after living a life of of lies, after just uh, agilely moving through the course of life trying to fool people, that he really lacks the qualities and substance in life to be truly successful. And here he is, a broken lonely, despairing man, and he realizes now that he's at a place of such desperation, he must steal. He breaks into a house in Chicago, and as he's rummaging through the jewelry drawer of these, this elderly couple's home, unbeknownst to him, he has broken into the home of his own parents who he had no idea had moved to Chicago years before. And his mother awakens to see his silhouette 
leaning over that dresser drawer, rummaging through that jewelry drawer. And she quickly gets up, recognizes his silhouette, and says to him, Precious son, this is the night your father and I have always prayed for. And she leans in to embrace him and to kiss his cheek, and he pulls away. He's ashamed. He's embarrassed. He's startled. And he says to her, you don't know how much you pardon. And the mother said, how much or how little, that doesn't matter. She says, have you wandered so far in life and paid such a great price, bitter price for knowledge and not yet learned that love has nothing to do with forgiveness or pardon? Love just loves and loves and loves. And she embraced him and held him and kissed his cheek. And it was in that moment of his darkest life experience that the dawn began to break through. Because he realized the liberating power of love. And it set him loose on a course that he would have never known before. God's love is a liberating love. It's a love that he has initiated for your benefit. But what we also notice here in in verse 6 is that it's transformational. It's a transforming love. Now notice how John speaks of it in his vision. He says, and he has made us. Well, that's a significant word. He's made us. And he's made us to be a kingdom, priest, to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now don't don't miss the significance of this. Because in our evangelical tradition, tragically there is this one dimensional view and understanding of salvation. That somehow we are just delivered from something. That we're just delivered from our sins. When in fact there is much more to this narrative of salvation that that tragically the, the evangelical tradition has truncated and cut short. Because we're not just we're not just saved and redeemed from something, we are saved and redeemed for something, for a purpose, to be a kingdom, to be a very unique people, to be to be priests. That the world we go out into on a daily basis, we we are the ones that stand between them and God in their understanding of what it is to be a person of faith. That's the power of the priesthood of which we are called to be a part. So it means I need to heighten, I need a bigger vision of what it is to be a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. What it is to be a person that is truly redeemed. It's more than just getting away from the Egypt of my sin. It's also getting to the promised land of victorious living. But it takes a bigger vision. You have to overcome being locked in on just thinking about salvation as just this. Just my sins forgiven. When there's so much more to this narrative that has to be told. The office of a priest. That we play the, the role of mediator, reconciler. We, we heighten people's awareness and understanding of what it is to live in relationship with the Father. And this kind of renewed vision, and that's the key. You've got to have a vision of something different than what you are. You've got to have a vision that you embrace, a vision that you chase of all that is involved in being a follower of Jesus Christ, not just being saved from something. But it's about becoming what you are, and it takes vision for it to be accomplished. 
It's the vision you embrace. It's the vision that you chase every day. That's what gets you up out of bed on a daily basis, this vision that drives you. Because, listen, I'm convinced through the power of this gospel, through the power of the resurrected Christ, listen, if you can see it and if you can believe it, then you can achieve it. It can be done. It can be accomplished. If you see it, you believe it, you can achieve it. And listen, you've heard me preach for 16 years. I'm not perpetuating here trying to spout out some kind of health, wealth, prosperity gospel. That's not what that's about. But this is about the reality of the gospel. That's the reality I'm speaking to. It's the reality of God's love that is transformational. They can take your life from the Egypt of your sin to the promised land of victorious living that can transform your life to being more than you have ever imagined. And what God desires for you to experience and to be, listen, you're not going to pull it out from under a Christmas tree on Tuesday. It's something that's born, that's born out in the heart of each and every person that answers that call to follow me. And if God has initiated that in your heart, if he is prompting you, leading you, that voice in your heart that says, follow me, by answering that call, by saying, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. I don't know what all that looks like. I don't know all the implications of that. What I know is that you're calling me to follow you, and I'm willing to answer and to say yes. And it's only as you say yes that you tap in and that you discover all the possibilities that might be in your life. You can be transformed. You can walk in here one way and you can walk out another way this morning. That's the power of love and that's the Christmas story. Let's pray together. Father, my prayer is this morning is that if there's anyone here that has never answered that call to follow you, that this might be their moment. That this might be the moment where they take the first step upon the journey of a lifetime. This commitment of following after Jesus and all the implications that go with that. Father, how grateful we are that as you, that as you initiate this in our heart, it's not a matter of us cleaning up our act first. It's not a matter of you first cleaning us up. Then we are worthy of salvation. But Father, how grateful we are that you take us where we are as we are and that we begin the journey from where we are in life right now, believing that your Holy Spirit will begin immediately this work of transformation, cleaning us up, if you will, to become all the things that you would have us to become. And so we give this time, we open this altar, literally, and also figuratively, we open the altar of our hearts so that your Spirit might do his working and his bidding in our own hearts, in our own faith journey. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.